Hey guys, welcome back. My name is Katie and today I am reviewing the Grisha Trilogy by Lee Bardugo. So I'm going to do this trilogy review and I'm going to keep it to a spoiler free section and a spoilery section where I talk about a little bit about each individual book and in a more detail. And there are a few novellas or stories that go along with the Grisha trilogy, but I have not read them, so I will not be talking about them in this video. Let's get started. It is a YA fantasy novel, and it takes place in a world called a country called Ravka. And in Ravka, there are two armies. There is the first army, which is a normal army with soldiers and cartographers and all of that stuff. And then there is a second army, and the second army is made up of Grisha. The Grisha are people with special abilities. They can, they are sorted into three different categories, but they have these special abilities to, some of them can heal, some of them can fabricate new materials, some of them can summon winds and water and all of that stuff. It's really cool. And the Grisha, the second army, the Grisha, are ruled by one Grisha who is the only man with that kind of of power and he can summon darkness. So he is called the Darkling and he rules over this second army for the king. The protagonist in this series is called Alina and she is an orphan and she's a cartographer in the first army and everyone is tested for Grisha powers when they're eight and she did not pass that test but she finds out that she has a special kind of power in this book that can essentially help save the world. One thing that I really enjoyed about this series and you can see it on the covers but it's influenced a lot by Russia as well as like medieval Russia and I, I can see some Middle Eastern influence in it as well, and I don't know about you guys, but when I think about fantasy, especially young adult fantasy, it's always like Middle Ages Europe, like Graceling and those books, and you know, even like Lord of the Rings, you can see that Middle Ages, Middle Ages Europe thing going on. I don't know why I said Middle Ages twice, but... This was just a really refreshing take on young adult fantasy, and I really enjoyed all of the different sort of aspects of the culture that this fantasy series has. I thought this was a really awesome, fast-paced series, and there was a lot of really cool action going on, and there's romance, and there's mystery, and adventure, and if that's something that you're into, I would definitely recommend it. The side characters in this series make it really what it is. They make it so enjoyable and you meet all these different characters and you really end up loving them all. So I really enjoyed that aspect of this series. Among those side characters, you know, there's really kick-ass females in here not just the main character and that's something that I always look for in young adult literature because I tend to see a pattern where there's only one or two other females and those females are always way worse or not as cool as a main character. I'm sure you know what I mean, but this series has a lot of kick-ass females. It also has a few relationships that are really cool and diverse, and I really enjoyed it. So, yeah. I think that's it for the spoiler section. I'm going to go into a little bit detail about each book. I am going to... If you have read Shadow and Bone and you want to hear that part, just stop watching when I hold a Siege of Storm and start talking about that and stop watching when I hold a Rune and Rising. I hope that makes sense, but here we go. I thought this was a really good first novel, especially first fantasy novel in a trilogy. There were a few things, there were a few things that I had problems with and mostly it was the new terminology. Because it has Russian influence, there were a lot of terms that were very difficult to spell and difficult to pronounce in my head head and a lot of them looked the same. So I had to really concentrate on remembering which term was which and I don't think that that's really the problem. It's more that we got all these terms really really quickly. I didn't have time to dig digest what one term meant before I got another one thrown at me. I don't know what you guys thought about all the new terms. Eventually I got into it but it was just a little slow start having to learn all of those new words. My second problem with this series is gonna be, like, 
I feel like no one else had this problem, but she named the main male protagonist Mal, M-A-L, and I can't even, I don't even know what, they say his Maltsev or something like that is his full name. It's written like twice in the book. And Mal translates to bad in French, and I'm pretty sure it translates to bad in other languages as well. So I did not trust Mal at all all during this book. I think that's why I didn't like their romance at first in this book because I was convinced he was gonna betray her. His name means bad. Like, okay, the villain, the Darkling, like, he can summon darkness and he's a villain. Like, I understand why he's named the Darkling, but Maul? Like, why is he named Maul? I don't get it. I don't know. And so I didn't trust him at all in this book. And let me know if I'm the only one and I'm just reading way too much into it. But, yeah, that's what I've got for you. That was, those are my two main problems with this, with this book. Siege and Storm, if you have not read this, leave because I'm going to spoil it. This was my favorite of the trilogy and I really enjoyed it. And I think we all know why, because Nikolai. Nikolai, Nikolai, Nikolai. Um, I really enjoyed all of the new characters that we met in this in this book, and I think we got to know them a lot more. We did meet a lot of characters in Shadow and Bone, but because Alina felt so isolated, I feel like we didn't really get to know them as much. But with this one, like Tamar and Toya, Toya and Nikolai and all of those great people. I'm really, really excited that we got to see them and meet them in this book. Also, the whole pirating thing was really cool. And I really enjoyed the overall plot of this book. I thought the events in this book moved along very nicely. I really liked the end when Alina sacrifices herself and her, her struggle with darkness and and her connection with the darkling i think that was handled really really well so yeah so ruin and rising was actually my least favorite of the trilogy and i don't really know why i have some of my reasons but i didn't like this one as much as i thought i would and i didn't like it as much as the other ones and i think that's for the most part is because things kept happening it was like slow, slow, slow event craziness for like 20 pages and then it was slow again. And, and that happened like five times, which was really frustrating. Like they kept getting interrupted by the Darkling. Like at least three times the Darkling foiled their plans. Come on, man. And I get why it happened, but it was just really frustrating over and over again for her to keep meeting the Darkling and then just running away. So that I think was frustrating. Another thing that I thought was really frustrating about this was that Mal, as this is a major spoiler, guys, this is a major spoiler. So please, if you have not read this book, leave. So another thing that was frustrating for this was the Mal as the third amplifier. I don't, I didn't think it was foreshadowed enough for it to make any sense. Um, I don't remember anything talking about how Morzova made the amplifiers until she said it at the end. Like if they talked about resurrection being how he made the amplifiers before this happened, I would have been like, oh, okay, then yeah, like that makes sense. He made his daughter into an amplifier. And I, I don't know if she did it because she wanted it to be a twist, but I just thought it was really frustrating. I think it could have been foreshadowed a little more, at least a little bit, um, for it to make a lot more sense. We don't ever find out how Alina got her powers. Like, we understand why Mal is such a good tracker, and we get why the Darkling is can summon darkness, and his mother is the way that she is, but we never understand Alina and why and her parents and she keeps flashing us to this cattle and tulips or something like that and we never I maybe I misread it maybe I skipped a part I don't I don't know but tell me if you guys have any ideas I just was really frustrated that we never found out what how I know that she doesn't have power anymore but we never found out why she got it in the first place. But overall, I thought it was a really en enjoyable series. I thought it was, this was an enjoyable book. And uh, I was so upset, guys. I was so upset when 
Nikolai got turned into a niche, niche or whatever it was called. I had to set the book down and then I had to read, like skim ahead to make sure that his name was in the future chapters. That's how upset I was. I really shipped Nikolai and Alina and I know that a lot of his moves were strategic, but I feel like he did genuinely like her and they were friends and she definitely like had feelings for him and I don't know, I just wanted them to be, get, be together so bad. But, oh, Nikolai, Nikolai and Alina belong together and I've heard rumors that Lee is going to give Nikolai his own book so I'm really excited about that. And she's also coming out with a new series. I think it's just two books actually. It's a duology that's set in the same world. And I'm super excited because there's a lot on these maps in the front. And there are a lot of places that we never get to go to. So I'm really excited that she's going to continue to explore this world. I really enjoyed this series. And I hope you guys did too. Let me know what you thought in the comments. And I will see you next time. Attend. What are you doing? Please. No. Hey.